And now, without further ado, let me invite Catherine Price up on the screen. Welcome, Catherine. Hello. Hi. Thank Thanks for so joining much. us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just like such an honor. I wanted to just share with the audience because I know it's all all the book people that this has been a dream of mine to be a writer since I was a little kid. I actually have this, I brought this little journal to show people this is when I was nine and I was like obsessed. Oh my God. Chronicling a trip to, um, to England with my parents. And so to go from that to being able to be part of the Random House and Penguin Random House family and have these books is just so cool. So I just couldn't be more thrilled to be here and so grateful for everyone I've worked with over the years. Well, um, well, thank you for that. There are many ways to kind of officially introduce you, um, but I think our audience will appreciate that the New York Times has called you the Marie Kondo of brains. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I given that that um, that we published the original Marie Kondo book, I thought I thought everybody would would like to hear that. Um, you're, a, of course, an award-winning uh, science journalist, and, and as you just illustrated, you've written books about topics as diverse as vitamins and cell phones. Um, and so um, I think that's a great indication of kind of how, how your, your mind works and sort of able to latch on to these, these seemingly disparate topics and to kind of pull us into, into those, those worlds. Um, of course, the topic for today is your new book, um, which I'm going to hold up again in my little virtual world here, The Power of Fun. Um, and I do feel like we should start by acknowledging that talking about the pursuit of fun during a global pandemic might seem slightly off um, to some. Um, but even though the power of fun does not quite have the ability to combat a deadly virus, um, you make a really compelling case that, um, that true fun um, which we'll, we'll talk about how you define that, but, but essentially that having maintaining a really healthy emotional diet is not only good for our mental health, but it's also really important for how we thrive as physical beings too. Um, so can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. Cause I think that's a natural question to ask with everything going on in the world right now. Why fun? You know, my yeah. husband's uncle, in fact, asked me that when I said I was writing this book. He said, really, is this a good idea? And I had to write a note back to convince him. So I'd say first things first, we should just acknowledge that this is only applicable if our basic needs are met. You know, if anyone's struggling to keep the lights on or to have food on the table or is currently sick, I mean, we're not trying to say you should also have fun on top of that. But beyond that, I think it's really important to recognize, I mean, based on the research I've done in the course of writing this book, that we have a number of misunderstandings, I think, about fun that are useful to clear up. And, or, or mis the ways we approach things could be changed. And one of it is that I think we tend to approach life as if it's zero sum. Mm -hmm. And we act as if we're all following that, that bumper sticker maxim, which is if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So if you're not paying attention all the time to all the scary um, stuff in the news, then you're not being a good person, you're not helping the world, you're not doing your duty as a responsible adult. But I don't think that's really the case. We can be more than one thing at once. We can be responsible citizens and also take care of ourselves and enjoy our lives. So I think that's one thing that I've noticed is a frequent thing I think that we should try to shift a bit is to allow ourselves to have both of these things at once. And then I think that just reflects the fact that we think that fun is frivolous. You know, mm -hmm. that's the biggest pushback I get. It's like, yeah, it'd be nice if it happens, but until I get everything else in place, I'm not gonna have time for fun. So I think we have this, this idea that fun is the result of human flourishing. You have to already be flourishing to have fun. But what I found is the opposite is actually that fun can help us flourish. And that is what is so powerful about it. And you and I will get more into what I, how I define fun, but two things I wanna highlight in terms of why it's so powerful are the emotional component. Like when we're having fun, we're very connected with people and we also feel joyfully alive. And that really adds to our resilience. And I can tell you, because I signed the book contract for this in April, 2020, which as you all may recall, was kind of a stressful time. And then wrote this book over the next year. It actually really helped me to focus on fun while in the midst of this terrifying pandemic and all of the political stuff and the unrest that was going on. It was actually very helpful for resilience. And the other thing I think is fascinating is the physical effects of fun. Because as we can get into more later, if you want to, fun reduces our stress. And anything that reduces our stress levels actually has a physiological effect on our bodies and reduces cortisol. And when your cortisol levels are lowered, it's actually wonderful for your health. 
it's actually an, it makes fun into an unacknowledged health intervention um, because increased cortisol levels over time are linked to all sorts of bad health outcomes from heart attack and stroke to type two diabetes and obesity and even cancer. And going to what we were just saying at the beginning about, well, you know, fun can't help us with the global pandemic. It actually made me think crazy though it may sound in a way it can because when you reduce your stress levels you actually boost your immunity mm. so there's actually an argument to be made i mean i'm not saying this is the solution to covid of course but the people should still get vaccinated yeah probably get vaccinated yeah. <laughs> wear masks while you're at yeah and get the vaccine yeah, yeah. But, you know but it's interesting to think that this concept we take for granted or don't think about at all actually is so much more powerful than we give it credit for yeah it's not frivolous it is not ones. frivolous yeah um, you came to the idea of this book, your, your most recent book was about breaking up with our phones and, um, it, well, there obviously you wrote an entire book about that topic. Um, so we could, we could, could spend an hour just talking about that. I do think it is, it is helpful just to talk about kind of the link in your, in your thinking between how you reckoned with screen time, um, and the, 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 the kind of the role of phones as being fun destroyers. Um, and so how you then came to this book. Well, I have a history and an interest in turning my personal issues into professional projects. <laughs> so that's the first thing I would Very say. Very clever. Uh, yeah, which is, it works well for me personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I had this moment in about 2016 that really, that inspired how to break up with your phone. I just had a baby. I had no interest in technology before this, by the way. And um, I was up late one night feeding her. And I had this moment where I noticed that she was looking up at me as I was looking down at my phone at doorknobs on eBay, <laughs> of all things. Yeah. And it just really, really affected me. It was, you know, I like to think I'm a self-aware person and I just thought this is not the impression I want her to have of a relationship with her mother of all people. And it's also not how I wanna be living my own life and I need a change. So that's what inspired how to break up with your phone. And at that point, it was really hard to get anyone interested in it, which was very interesting. And now I've since heard from people all around the world. It's being published in 33 countries. It's been such a interesting experience for me. But I realized myself that after I had broken up with my phone, which I should clarify means creating a healthier relationship, not, not throwing the phone out the window. Right. Unless right. But I, I came to realize that once you take away some of that phone time, you're left with more free time. And I had this moment on the couch, actually in this very room where my daughter was napping, my husband was out. I should have had this glorious chance to do whatever I wanted to with, because I was trying to not use my screens. And I couldn't think of anything that I wanted to do. And being me, I quickly catastrophized and said, you know, I'm just waiting for dinner, which means I'm just waiting to die. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to just be waiting to die. I want to live my life. Yeah. What am I going to do with this time? And that launched me on the journey that led to the power of fun and also partially explains its subtitle, which is how to feel alive again. Yeah. Um, I, I was reminded of, um, of these themes when um, just this in the last couple of days, I was delving into, we do these um, every other year employee surveys um, that the, our parent company has been doing for decades. And so it's kind of an interesting way to give you kind of long, long range data um, about how we all feel about, about our work and, and our life in the company. And um, one of the, well, well, in general, people say, you know, they, they express a lot of positivity about um, how they feel about their work. There's one trend line that has been getting increasingly negative since 2013, and it is work-life balance. And um, it, when we first got the results this year, everybody was, the, the first impulse is to attribute that to um, the pandemic because we're now we're, we're working it remotely, most of us. And, um, and so the, the boundaries between work and life are, um, are not clear, but looking at the data and seeing that this went back to 2013, um, I just did a, then a quick search and saw that 2013 was indeed kind of an inflection point in terms of the penetration of smartphones into the American market, that that's, that's the point at which more than 50% of the people had smartphones and probably kind of in the knowledge working world, that probably means like 
80% of the people had smartphones. So it's, it's interesting that um, to, to, um, to see these different points of data showing that screens and our kind of addiction to them is having this, this very corrosive impact on, on our emotional health. So um, did, uh, you know, as your, as your husband was saying, um, you know, is now really the time to study fun um, with, a, with a global pandemic, but also I imagine that you have had a lot of people reacting to the idea of um, studying fun um, and the kind of the counterintuitive nature of, um, of can you, does that mean you really take the fun out of um, the fun out of, of fun if you if you study it too hard, um, <laughs> but get, you know maybe maybe take us a little bit into what your process was like how did how did you once you decided this was going to be you went from that moment of I don't want to just sit around waiting to die I want to live again um, how did you approach it both personally and then by extension um, in the book yeah well first I should clarify my husband's uncle was skeptical okay all oh. right. All right. my husband in trouble here he was okay. he's always been very supportive of okay okay <laughs> peter would be upset if he my apologies this. yeah yeah no, you're... <laughs> um well it was interesting there were a lot of interesting parts about writing this book because as i said it was in the midst of probably the most i mean for me personally like anxiety filled time yeah. in recent memory if not my life right in the beginning of, yeah. the, of the pandemic um but the approach i took was actually similar to what i did for how to break up with your phone which i i came up with some of my own ideas based on my background, as you said, as a science journalist and my experience writing about positive psychology and happiness and health. And also I have a background in mindfulness. Um, so I used that to kind of come up with some ideas, but I didn't want to just have this be my ideas with no feedback from other people. So I recruited what I call the fun squad, which was this global group of volunteers that I don't even know the last number, but I think it was over a thousand people. And I asked them to give me feedback on my ideas. But the first thing I did with them was to ask them to share with me anecdotes of three experiences from their life that they would describe as having been quote so fun very technical mm -hmm. term mm -hmm. <laughs> with so was capitalized so <laughs> fun and the reason i did that is that i had a hypothesis for what i thought the definition of fun might be but i wanted to check this with other people i should back up and say one of the craziest and most most interesting things about the process of writing about fun is that i came to realize there's no good agreed upon definition of fun. You know, the best thing you'll find in the dictionary is lighthearted pleasure. But if you ask people, and even I invite people listening to this right now to reflect on an experience from your own life where you, you felt it was so fun, where you felt joyfully alive, that's kind of the feeling people got. It's not just lighthearted pleasure. Um, so that, that was the, the process was to get these anecdotes from people and then several survey questions in because I didn't want to mess up my own process and plant seeds in their mind. I ran my definition by them to see if it matched. But when I read through these people's anecdotes, it, it, every time I do, I am both smiling and also almost tearing up because there's something very joyful and just profound about them. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, um, was it hard to take fun seriously? Well, yeah, I think that there is an element of you can't, you can't try to nail fun down too much or it will run away. But I actually found it fascinating to think more seriously about something we talk about but don't think about and that actually is the connection between some of my other work so for vitamins my book vitamania how vitamins revolutionize the way we think about food it was this realization that even though we talk about vitamins you know one day my husband turned to me and said what is a vitamin mm -hmm. and i opened my mouth to answer I, all i could think of was was like pirates with vitamin c and scurvy and he <laughs> said you should write a book about it and i ended up spending three years writing huh. a book about vitamins so that's that was actually really interesting to me, taking fun seriously. And I think that all of us should take fun more seriously because if you really think about what brings you fun, then you can start to create more opportunities in your life to have more fun mm -hmm. and to reap its emotional benefits and physical benefits and just have more fun. Mm -hmm. And and through through the studies, through you know, reviewing what the fun squad was doing, you were able then to, you know, you kind of constructed a framework of the fun formula, the formula for, for, for true fun. So, um, and I, I really liked the, the three elements of that. So maybe describe those to us. Well, the definition that I propose is that fun or true fun, as I call it for reasons I can explain, um, is the confluence of three states, playfulness, connection, 
and flow. Mm -hmm. When you have these three things together, you have fun. And to go into a bit more detail of what I mean about those things, playfulness does not mean you have to play a game. Adults hate the word play. They clench up and get extremely uncomfortable. So relax guys, you don't have to play make-believe or like go LARPing or something. It just means bringing a lighthearted attitude to what you're doing, not caring too much about the outcome and not trying to be perfect because adult life is all about just trying to demonstrate our competence and not feel like an idiot. And that's really tiring. And when you experience an opportunity to let go of that, it's very freeing. Mm -hmm. And then connection <clears throat> is feeling, well, I'm defining it with the definition, but sense of connection, mm -hmm. sometimes with the activity itself, sometimes with your physical environment or even your body, because we're so much, you know, we act like we're just head sitting on bodies instead of mm -hmm. a whole human being. In the vast majority of examples people shared with me though, the connection was with another human being, which was very interesting. And that was true for introverts too, which I feel I should point out to a group of people who like to read books. Yeah. <clears throat> it was, and any these people reflected on it and said one thing that surprised them was that other people were involved. Mm -hmm. So playfulness, connection, and then flow, as many people might know, is the psychological state in which you get so engrossed in what you're doing. And so you're so actively engaged in it that you lose track of time. So the most common example is an athlete in the middle of a game or a musician who's playing music. It's very different from the junk flow as it's called that you get into of say you're scrolling through Instagram and you know, sure time is flying, mm -hmm. but you're not active and engaged. So I think all three of those states are very beneficial on their own. In fact, there's plenty of research proving that. Um, but I would argue that when all three of them happen at once, you experience what I call true fun. And when I asked the fun squad members, again, after asking them to share their experiences, and then I asked them to define true fun themselves to see what they would say. And then I proposed my definition. The vast majority of people said that actually really nailed the, mm -hmm. the experiences that I described. Mm -hmm. And I think that will resonate with all of us. And, and um, I, I want to get more into what you, you know, how you then approach this, um, or what you recommend that how we approach it. But the but first i just want to to acknowledge that element of the connection with other people is the part that clearly has been most under threat um in during social isolation and yet you wrote this book during during the the peak months of of the pandemic um and you're communicating with people on the fun squad who were also in experiencing that same period of time. So what, what insights did you have about how to find fun um, when you're actually isolated from other humans? That I think was the biggest challenge, you know, to realize yeah. more and more how important human connection is. And I should say, not just because it makes us feel good, it's actually enormously important for us physically. Isolation and loneliness affect us down to the level of how genes are expressed. There was one researcher I quote in my book who talked about loneliness as a quote, fertilizer for other diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So that was the hard part. I think one way I coped with that was to prioritize it. Once you realize that actually human connection, and I should say not like, texting connection, I mean, there's some benefit to that, but certainly not social media connection, mm -hmm. that real human connection, once you realize that that is really important and you make it, a, then you make it a priority. So during the peak of lockdowns last year for me personally, obviously none of us were really doing much, but I have a group of friends who I play music with regularly. And one of the hardest parts was not being able to do that, but we realized, well, we still could do it. We just needed to go outside, wear masks, be like 15 feet apart. Um, and then we would, we could do it. We did that in, I live in Philadelphia in January. Like we did this when it was 30 degrees out. I bought a heat lamp and I got a lot of hot hands and yeah. we would just bundle up. That's ridiculous, but it brought so much joy and fun into my life and going to the, what we were talking about before about resilience. It helped me through the pandemic. It was something to look forward to. It was human connection. And we just made it happen in mm -hmm. a safe way because it was that important. So I think, you know, we need to recognize the importance of connection. And even now where it's so I don't know how everyone out there is feeling, but I feel so confused as to, <laughs> I'm yeah. still super cautious, but to try to make a point of calling people on the phone instead of just emailing, you know, or going for a walk with a friend, even as it gets colder, like put on a heavier coat and actually do make that effort. I think that one of the, 
I mean, benefit sounds too strong, but one thing I've noticed from the pandemic and Madeline, I know you and I've talked about this before is we've gotten so de deprived of human connection that when you yeah. do have that moment, it feels so good. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> so notice that. I, I'll share what, uh, a story I, I shared with you, with the group. I'll share with uh, a story I shared with you ahead of time, which is that um, uh, about six weeks or, or so ago, when things were feeling a little safer than, than they are now, um, a, a, one of my colleagues was, um, what expressed, uh, concern about a particular challenge that she was, she was dealing with. And we'd been talking about it, um, regularly by phone. Um, and, uh, but it just, it, I could tell that, you know, for her, she did not feel like she was having a breakthrough. And so, um, we ended up gathering a couple of us in a very safe, safe way, um, but we were together in person, um, and it wasn't just two of us together. It was like five of us together and it was, it was a Friday. Um, so we have meeting free Fridays. So this was officially not a meeting. It was, it was, um, a, a gathering and we, we just ended up spending many hours, um, together safely discussing the, the problem. So this was, was work, but the fact that we were together in person and that it wasn't just a one-on-one -on -one connection, it was, it was five or six of us. Um, it was the, the, I think we all felt like we were on drugs and I mean, it, it was, it was so great. We were like, we were over the top excited about the experience. And, um, and I think that that is really a testament to this idea of the sensory deprivation that, um, that we have all experienced, the kind of the, the social deprivation that we've experienced, um, where you can get together with one person and take a walk, but to, to have a, even a slightly larger cell of people is, is more challenging. But I also think, you know, when you tell that story, it reflects, I mean, I've noticed when I talk to people about fun, you can see it in their face. Like people yeah. light up when they talk yeah. about times that they've had fun. And then one thing I've also noticed that I, I wanted to ask you about, like when I have those experiences, when I had those experiences with my friends outside, even though we were freezing, yeah. you know, it buoyed me for the whole week. Oh and my God. Yes. How long did you feel good as a result? Oh my God. Like weeks. <laughs> <laughs> weeks and weeks. I, I confess it's part of why I, I am, you know, am feeling um, as everybody else is now uh, sort of dismayed by the idea that uh, it felt like we were just on the verge of being able to do more and more of that. And now we, it looks like we're, we're not going to be able to. Um, and I, I, you know, bes besides your um, your, your cold musicians, um, which feels like a particularly valiant, um, uh, attempt. Were there other ways that you learned of either from the fun squad or, or for yourself that, um, that people were able to really, you know, have that kind of the magic triangle of the connection, the playfulness and flow, um, either while on screens or because you had to, or just away from screens, but still in social isolation. Yeah, I mean, a couple of thoughts on that. I think one of the, because I, you, believe me, I feel the same way that you just described, just this yeah. feeling of deflation of like, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, try not to cry while you're talking about fun, Catherine. Try not to yeah. cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yes. So I, I hear you. And I've been thinking about this myself, yeah. just going forward. I would say that that one thing is to just, once you recognize the power of playfulness and connection and flow as life-giving forces that yeah. will make you feel good and be good for you, then you can make a point of prioritizing them and to switch from thinking of fun as something that's just the afterthought to something that actually be, should be at the top of your priority list. Because mm -hmm. guys, this might be a really rough winter. Like we need to yeah. find ways to yes. be resilient and to feel, to experience some joy. We, we need that. We yeah. really need yeah. that. Yeah. So I think, first of all, prioritize it. Think about ways that you can bring playfulness or connection or flow into your life or into the lives of people that you're around. You know, be a little bit silly. Like, let's just forget about formality for a little bit. It's like year yeah. two, We're almost into year three of this pandemic. Yeah, just, yeah. Let be a little silly. I love the idea that you guys are doing those igloo, uh, the um, the pet, the igloo yeah. awards, awards. Yeah, um, find ways to connect with people. Like yeah. 
you know, do go for that walk, even if it's with just one person or give someone a silly gift or something like that. And for flow, try to eliminate some of the distractions. I think we go into what you were saying earlier, where we really do need to create better boundaries between our personal lives and our work lives, or just figure out how and when we want to be interrupted. Because one of the biggest impediments and blocks to, to fun is distraction. Is anything that distracts us means we can't be in flow and we won't be as connected. And if you're not in flow, you can't have fun. And that's another connection between our phones and fun is try to find a time to put them away and put the world, let the world be out there for a bit and just focus on your experience. And the other thing I would say that I found useful, I found this useful last summer or two summers ago when I was writing the book and I find it useful now is to recognize that in many cases, we tend to think that in order to have fun, we have to do something really big and exotic, like go on a trip or, you know, get together with your college friends for a weekend in some other place. And then you can feel like, well, you can't do that now, so I can't have fun. And that can be very demoralizing. Um, and it is disappointing. But I would say that one thing I've noticed is that if you start to scan your everyday life, even pandemic life, for just moments of playfulness, connection, or flow, you're probably going to find that you're already experiencing some of them, but you just haven't acknowledged them. And once you start to notice them, it's kind of a mindfulness exercise, then you begin to appreciate them and you'll start to feel their benefits. And once you start to feel their benefits, you're going to notice more of them. It's very self-perpetuating and it really doesn't take much. I mean, there was an example someone shared with me recently that I absolutely loved because I, I like to talk about the metaphor about how I think there's opportunities for fun floating in the air around us all the time in the sense of there's opportunities for playfulness and connection and flow, even micro moments, like seconds worth, it makes a difference. So I use that metaphor. And then I talked to this guy who told me about having had true fun as he, does, as he called it just that past weekend with his nephew, when they were sitting outside on a park bench, trying to catch leaves as they fell off of a tree. And he said, it was so fun. They spent two hours doing that. Oh and, I, and the writer in me was like, you just made my metaphor literal. Oh my God, I'm so excited. But I just thought <laughs> that it was so beautiful because it just, yeah. showed, I'm, and I tried it. That's the other thing, it feeds off of things. So talk mm -hmm. with your friends and your colleagues about fun. Because once he said that, I was on a walk with my husband and there's like tree leaves falling and we're running around trying to catch the leaves. <laughs> I was like, this is fun. I'm in a moment of playful connected flow with my husband. It's ridiculous and absurd. My point being, it doesn't necessarily take much. So don't berate yourself or get depressed, overly depressed, more depressed than you already are. Yeah. About the challenges we're facing. You know, there are more opportunities than we than we recognize. And oh, it's just so worth paying attention to them. Well, and and another, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but one thing I've thought about recently is that um, in the before times, many of us had very much like overly jammed social social schedules which were the sort of combination of social and work and like things at night that you had had to go to or theoretically were going to be fun but because it was just this sort of hamster wheel effect of so much stimuli um rarely were those things actually fun and that if you think of the experience of these past two years as the kind of the great reset that as you've started to be able to um, introduce selective interactions and even understanding that this winter, those may be selective indeed, that I do think we appreciate them more than, than we ever did before. And that even if we get to a, a period where things are more, um, more normal again, um, I hope that that's something that we're all going to be able to hold on to, not just kind of having these overly jammed um, lives, but really being very thoughtful about, while well, spontaneous, about um, about how we want to interact with other other humans. I, I think that that's true, and that fun can help guide us because I think that a yeah. lot of us started to recognize, oh wait, like I, I was too busy, or I didn't want to do that much. While well, we're also, you know, desperately craving human yeah. contact, but. I noticed one thing as things started to open up over the summer <laughs> was just people got so busy so fast, despite all their talk of, oh, you know, now I know what's important to me. It's like, well, apparently everything is important to us because we're running around like crazy people, which makes sense because we're so deprived. But for me personally, it's been useful to, and, and I recommend this to other people as well, to really become more reflective about how you feel in these experiences. If you do go to a social event are you actually enjoying yourself are you actually experiencing playfulness and connection and flow um are the people that you're with helping you to experience those things in my book i refer to these as fun magnets 
-hmm. In other words, the activities and the settings and the people that tend to generate fun for us personally. Because I argue that while the definition of fun is universal, that it's playful, connected flow, the way that we each find it is different and it varies on the person. But I think part of the challenge is that we just kind of, since we don't think about fun much, much we go along with whatever we've kind of been conditioned to think of as fun or maybe the people we used to think are fun or what, but that's not actually fun. We don't feel playful or connected or in flow. We feel self-conscious or bored or not present. And now that we know that we really should be trying to prioritize the things that truly matter to us, that truly do make us feel nourished, then I think it, it can be useful to use fun to select what to prioritize. So that's something I do for myself. Now that I know what some of my personal fun magnets are, I really prioritize those things. And I say no to other things. I mean, as if I have a busy social schedule right now, I do not, <laughs> you know, but it helps you pick your priorities and then make them happen even if the circumstances are challenging. Um, as we go into now, we're very close to the end of the year and, and uh, we get a nice, nice break away from, from work, away from email, hopefully away from the phones. Um, what, what is a very practical approach that we can take? So if we want to do our own kind of fun audit, um, and kind of use the, the power of that to, to go into 2022, what, how do, how do we approach it? And I know you're going to provide us, um, or have already provided us with some, um, some ancillary material. Um, but if you can just kind of introduce that for us. Well, first of all, do try to take a break from your phone and your email. Cause I know you people. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my book comes out on December 21st. So maybe, so, so maybe you want, you want some, some connection. Yeah, so but... people, I'm really sorry for everyone's <laughs> holiday that I'm, I'm working with. But, you know, I think our tendency is to still, still constantly be on call and to just keep going through those motions, even though it is an opportunity for a break. So I really do encourage people to try to try to set some boundaries there, use an auto response, you know, make some plans, make some alternate plans so that you have things you know you're going to do, because otherwise you might just end up right back on your screens, which is what we've been doing for the past two years. Yeah. But, um, but I also think in terms of a fun audit, it can be useful to do just the process that I was describing a minute earlier of asking yourself to reflect on some of the, your past experiences from any time in your life that in which you felt this feeling of true fun, in which you felt joyfully alive. And you know, spend a little bit, you're all writer, writerly people, you probably actually have journals, but you can actually jot down some anecdotes and encourage your friends to do this too. It's a really interesting conversation starter. Something you could even do over the holidays is to reflect on some of these experiences where you experienced, where you had true fun. And then ask yourself, what were you doing? Who were you with? You know, uh, where were you? Were there any objects or props involved? Like for example, pickleball, really popular right now. Everyone loves pickleball. I have not tried it, but just the name itself sounds pretty fun. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, yes, yes. Um, but think about these fun magnets and then think about how you might be able to build some of them. I mean, some of them may be inaccessible depending on how restricted we are, but how could you build some of these things into your schedule? And even if you can't do the full on fun magnets, how could you build in a couple opportunities for playfulness or connection or flow into your everyday life? And that I think is really important because going back to what you were asking me about, well, if you take fun too seriously, doesn't it just kind of run away? Same thing people ask or when you think, can you plan for fun? Right. Because at the outset, that sounds ridiculous. If I were to take my planner and write down that, you know, from 8 to 10 p.m. this Saturday, I'm going to have fun. Mm -hmm. That fun is going to be like out of here. It's just laughable. Um, but if I know what my fun magnets are, then I can put those on my schedule. Is it guaranteed to produce fun? No, because fun is an emotional state and you can't pin it down, right? You can have a dinner party with the same people that's amazingly fun and this, then a dinner party with the same folks and it's kind right. of blah. But like for me, for example, I know that music brings me fun very often. It's a fun magnet for me. So I make a point of putting that on my schedule. I can put that on my schedule from four to six on a Saturday afternoon. And I think the more that we're able to do that, the more fun we're likely to have, the better we're likely to feel, the more resilience we'll have to get through whatever this next phase is. And also as kind of a nice compliment, you'll end up spending less time on screens because you actually won't want to. You know, right now we're turning to our screens so often for an emotional reason, we're bored or we're anxious or we're lonely. And we fail to recognize that often 
spending time on those apps is resulting in just increasing those negative emotions. It's not alleviating it, alleviating it. it makes us feel more lonely and isolated, mm-hmm. more anxious and stressed. Like when's the last time the news made you feel good guys? You yeah. know? But if you start having more opportunities for fun, you'll start to find that screen time decreasing on its own because you will feel more engaged and present in your life. And I think that for me, that's one of the biggest powers of fun. Well, I think that's a, um, that's a pretty good note to, uh, for us to end on. And, um, and I, I know we distributed ahead of time, the, um, the copies of, of your book digitally to employees. And I know people have been, have been diving in, um, and afterwards, and I'll, I'll follow up with an email to folks, um, with a link to a page resource page you put together. You want to see my high tech ready guys. Yeah. 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 We'll send it out. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but howtohavefun.com has a lot of resources as I'm putting together a special sign up page just for PRH, where if you sign up, I'll g- give you some uh, resources to try to help, okay. uh, help your journey towards more fun. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, um, and for everybody else, um, we, will, we will sign off now. But um, I encourage you, remember, go, go vote for, um, for the dogs on the Igloo Awards and um, for any of the other categories. Uh, sign up for to be a mentor or a mentee. And, um, and congratulations again to all the, the publishers and the authors who are getting a lot of, of wonderful recognition at this time of year and wonderful sales. So thank you all. See you on the 14th. Bye.